decisions when it comes to politics. But at a subtle level, we're all being persuaded that those discussions, whether or not they're even real. As you've seen, it doesn't take much to influence your brain. This one. The smallest, subtle fact. Hello, hello. Hope you guys can hear me, see me all right. So just popping on here real quick. I've uh, been having people asking me as far as updates and so forth. So a lot of the stuff changing. Um, right here is just a uh, tip and pour um, for uh, Michael Geophagus German Blue Ram Fry. I want to say I probably only had four that were unfertilized. Um, so definitely stay tuned. I'll be bringing you guys a lot more on uh, good tips and tricks as far as uh, breeding these guys successfully and conditioning them to handle um, more of a neutral to uh, harder water parameters. So, um, but yeah. So let's see if we can be able to zoom up on these guys. Uh, they are microscopic right now. Um, so not sure how well it's gonna show up. But let's see. You can somewhat see them. Right now they're just uh, eating through the egg sac. So that movement that you see is the, uh, the microgeos. So in about a week, I'll go ahead and start feeding them um, live microworms. And uh, again, I was uh, not to toot my own horn, probably one of the most successful breeders um, about 10 years back uh, with the microgeophagus. Um, people just had a very difficult time breeding them. Um, not necessarily getting them to spawn, because um, with most cichlids it's not difficult to get them to spawn. Uh, the difficult time that people have is conditioning them in order to actually successfully rear and raise the fry. So I'm excited to uh, be able to bring you guys some good content because these are by far one of my favorite dwarf cichlids um, ever and I think they always will be. So let's head on over here. Not much has changed in this portion of the uh, fish room. This is more of the breeding area. Uh, I want to say I have like 30 tanks or something in this part. Um, that over there is more of the um, the uh, display tanks. And then in here is where a lot of the changes are happening. I want to say right now I'm running on a total of 55 plus um, uh, tanks total throughout. Um, and a lot of this, the reason that this has taken place is due to the fact that those larger setups are eventually going to be broken down. And I plan on adding like three or four more of these stock tanks. And as a lot of you guys have been following me long enough, um, we do hopefully here in the near future able to get our house on the market. And essentially this area isn't going to be renovated, uh, but we do have to um, tighten up and or tidy up, I guess you would say, our family room and just kind of get things touched up in there. So eventually everything is going to end up getting moved into this room. It actually worked out handy. This I threw together in just a couple of hours. This is an old um, wooden rack system that uh, just utilized totes for. Um, when we first moved in, uh, basically 18, 20 gallon totes and it actually works out perfect to hold um, all of the tanks that I need. So we do still have more tanks in storage. I don't plan on getting the other tanks out of storage um, because a lot of these are 10s. Uh, I got a couple of 29s, uh, 20 longs and so forth. But yeah, a couple of 100 gallon stock tanks. These um, kitty ponds I'm going ahead and tear down um, and uh, actually transferring over. So um, my attachment broke, so I could have actually had this done in less than 30 seconds but um anyways i got a pump and right now i'm just kind of gives me some time to go ahead and work about and so forth um but yeah so a lot of the uh parthenogenic strains of the self cloning crayfish were in here um i probably had a couple of hundred of those at least so i'm going ahead and moved them in there uh, i got the got my um my smaller turtles in this tank temporarily so um they're loving it in there and uh, I still have a few uh, self cloning crayfish as well as uh, Ancestors Placos in here. And like I said, these are being broke down. There's nothing left in here besides some water. I'm uh, going to go ahead and drain this, get the substrate out. And I want this area completely open 
because like I said, eventually we're gonna add more in the future uh, of the stock tanks. And if you guys think that this is large, I can promise you, um, I don't say something unless I commit to it. I cannot wait to finally get out of this place and move someday because what I have in vision is gonna be massive. So um, it's gonna be a large investment, but you guys that know my story um, and so forth, I mean, this, you can't put money on sanity. And if we want to take this from a hobby into a business level, um, I've been in this for a very, very long time. I have people that have asked me, how do you know everything that you know? And it just comes down purely to experience. Um, a lot of times I know more than what I portray and I don't just say things to say it, um, so on and so forth. So, I mean, unless somebody asks me, I typically just don't say it. So, um, if I don't know, there's a lot of things I don't know. I, that's what I love about this hobby is, um, I don't consider my expert, uh, by any means, um, of the imagination. So, <laughs> as I always say to you guys, I'm an expert at failing a lot. That's what's made me successful. So, have some fancy guppies in here. Um, got an Aranda in there. Um, got some sore tails in here. Uh, a couple bettas in there. Got some Lucipennis, a breeding pair in there, as well as more guppies. Um, got uh, some more guppies in there. And then um, one of the next breeding projects I'm probably most excited about is the, uh, the uh, Blue Galaris. So I got a breeding pair in there. Um, and then of course the uh these are of the um the mycogeophagus germ blue ram cichlids uh, i got discus in here these guys are still being quarantined uh, as well as got a small ghost knife in there and uh placo in there and uh Severum. um i have some ancestors in here three sub adults in that tank just temporarily so lots of stuff moving around um like i said really i think the only thing left in here is just those turtles and uh, i got some come on um nothing in there empty empty basically empty besides the three placos um over here is uh, uh this is a Tank, uh, and so forth they're basically a discontinued item but they're really nice and uh so i picked three of them up a while back but this has our um pea puffers in it in this tank our dwarf pea puffers um saying i got a very bad connection so um let's see i'm gonna try to move closer here see if i can Okay, I'm standing right next to the router now, so that's why I cannot stand. I like the phone, I just cannot stand streaming from my phone because I end up, this ends up happening every time. So I do plan on auctioning some of these off tonight. Um, I'm going to end up keeping like 20 of them. Um, but, you know, as I told you guys, these are still listed on the website. If you want a good deal on these guys, uh, you're going to have to email me. The more you buy, the more you'll save. Um, again, I'm only shipping livestock to the continental U.S., um, but you don't have very much time. I would need to know within the next couple of hours because I do plan on auctioning a bunch of these off tonight at our club. Um, so, yeah. So, eventually, I'm kind of just getting out of... Um, African cichlids are just one of those things... Uh, it's hit and miss, especially with the Yell Labs. They're really a nice strain of Yell Labs. I mean, I've sold quite a few of them, but um, they're just, I mean, I want to keep 20 of them, eventually aquascape the tank and so forth and make it look really cool. But as far as breeding, it's just, it's boring. They're too easy. Uh, uh, you can see right here is the pair. Um, these guys, uh, of course, are the, uh, you got the male and female. Um, and so forth, but yeah. All right. Got the Blue Dream Shrimp in here. Um, 
Um, these guys are just going to take some time. They're quite small when I got them, so eventually these guys will be breeding. Uh, I got some antlers down here. Uh, breeding group of those. Small lucipennis in this tank. Um, you're not going to be able to see them. They're hiding in that, that um, spawning mop. They usually hide under here. Then in here is just a 20 long that's got some cherry shrimp. Eventually I'm going to break that down and move it. Uh, it doesn't have very much in it on that. Moving it over in the other room that I just showed you guys. And then I have a trio of Ancestors Plecos in this tank. So a breeding group. If you guys are interested, uh, you're going to have to email me. I don't keep those listed on the website. It's just kind of as first come, first serve basis. Um, and then here, of course, none of this has changed. This will stay in here for a while. Um, I don't want to mess around. This is going to be like last and eventually these will all be broken down and then moved um, But this whole rack system is housing um, all neocaridina shrimp um, And uh, here is the 55 that's got mystery snails. It's got Ancestrus it has more of the labidochromus that are growing out in this tank um, You can see that mystery snails everywhere. I got hundreds of them um these I keep down in here, so basically they get moved, and then I just kind of sort them by size. And then once they're down in here, this is when I'm ready to sell them. Um, so yeah. These are the uh, uh, Suelia species spotted. This is a reticulated hillstream loach. I want to say I have a total of, I don't know, quite a few. Um, maybe 14, 15. So as these guys continue to grow out, you can see that there's absolutely no water movement whatsoever. So the myth, I'm telling you guys right now, I've successfully housed these guys. Let's see if we can find it up here in the 20 long. The only thing I keep in here is a sponge filter. It all comes down to how you condition your fish. So when you guys are breeding fish, my recommendation is condition them to the average hobbyist aquarist if you want to successfully sell the problem is nobody's going to want to come back and buy from you if you're raising your fish in really soft waters you can condition discus you can condition the most sensitive if you want in my opinion one of the most difficult in my experience from all the things i've read through the years is going to be by far your mycogeophagus germ blue rams not spawning but raising and rearing the fry successfully with good genetics. So I do not condition those guys with soft water. I don't do anything special. It's a slow process. I've talked about it before. I've shared it before. Um, so if you really want to be successful breeding and selling, my opinion is stop trying to switch the water parameters. Condition them over to adapt to your water parameters. Uh, I'm not talking wild caught. You know anything like that again jimmy if you're watching these are the black corridoras i do have a breeding group of those i want to say i have a total of eight so eventually i will end up breeding so these are true black corridoras no spots nothing um they're all chocolate uh this kind of a sneak peek teaser this is the uh um come on can't even think now but um got some ancestors in here of course, a male. male. So eventually, this whole system will end up being broken down. Um, these are all drilled and uh, plumbed, so they're all on a continuous drip. So eventually, I will not be utilizing these once things get moved. I'll be basically putting these in storage uh, since I'm not going to be, you know, basically, once everything gets moved over to the other part, I'll probably be on a manual um, water change again. Um, because it's only going to be a temporary thing. I'm not going to worry about plumbing anything in. Uh, it wouldn't be that difficult to do, but right now I don't I don't anticipate or foresee um, me uh, doing like a sump over there to pump the water, uh, discharge water over down in here. But yeah. Then here is just 40 breeder. Got lots more of the uh, self clones, crayfish. Um, black corridors in here um, I have some guppy fry in here as well as I'm breeding a ton of the um, ram's horn snails but I feed the ram's horn snails to my pea puffers um, same thing with all these just uh, pond snails 
I got tons of those. So they come in really handy to feed. Um, this is uh, another exciting breeding project. These are the uh, electric um, Luacara. These guys are absolutely stunning. I got them when they were just teeny tiny. So eventually I end up breeding those. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think that's about it. Um, so we've been going on about 17 minutes. Let me flip this around. Let's see here. Hope you see some nice shoes you like. Yeah. Not sure if you're talking to me, but yeah. I don't wear shoes. I don't know if you guys have ever been to a fish farm or not, but yeah, a lot of them don't wear shoes either. And I don't blame them. All right. Um, let's see. I have everything on a GFCI, so I'm not too worried about it. Had it happen plenty of times. That's why I tell you guys, if you want to spare your life and the life of your fish, be on a GFCI. I could have lost my life on countless occasions if I didn't have that installed. Uh, basically, it's going to trip if there's ever a ground fault um, as far as interrupting that, and it's going to trip that uh, versus, yeah, having the worst uh, case scenario happen. So. I don't unplug heaters when I'm doing maintenance. I don't do any of that stuff. So, it does not concern me whatsoever. I mean, obviously, um, don't do as I, um, as I do, but as I say. So, obviously, safety. All right. So, I'm going to pull you all up here. I want to see what the connection's coming through. Not gonna be on here too long, you guys. Um, Eric, hello. Eric, uh, I do have a question for you. If you can see that form, of course, I'm not sure if it's showing up in a mirrored image or not. Can't remember how that works on the phone. Um, so yeah, I want to auction off um some of the yellow labs but i couldn't find any information on the uh on the website so i'm just curious of uh can i use that form is this that printable form um show seller id species quantity bag number all right Bear with me just a second, you guys. I'm just pulling me up. Seeing how bad the connection is. Yoo-hoo, I already got a thumbs down, awesome. Appreciate it. Okay, the connection isn't too bad. So, it does not hurt my, my feelings, y'all. You can go ahead and give it a thumbs down. I would rather you guys give it 10 thumbs down than nothing at all. So, Let's see here. I'm going to scroll up here in the chat. Um, let's see. Sam, Josh, Susan, hello. Uh, Sam says package is coming any minute now. Awesome, Sam. Um, uh, Jacqueline, hello. White. Uh, v Stag. Island Queen, Spicy said I'm fired, uh, Kevin, today's the day guys, field trip to get some zebra placos, Kevin's going to bow down and get those zebras, awesome, uh, sounds good Kevin, I hope you're getting a deal on them, better be a good deal, it's two and a half hour drive, uh, let's see here, uh, well not really, Abby, hello. Let's 
see. Uh, Sam, I breed my own mystery snails. I don't import anything. Don't import nothing. Find yourself a really good hobbyist and uh, get a good breeding group of something. Be critical. Be picky. Start off the right way. And uh, I don't think it's necessary to import. Not to say I'm not going to do that down the road someday, but there's things out there. You just got to look around for it. Sherry, hello. Michael, hello. Michael said the signal's rough in here. Might be on your end, Michael. I'm not sure. Signal's fine for me. Um, gotta go. Abby said, well, have a great day. All right. On the Holy Orders, what's up, Sergeant? How you doing? Chicago Poppy, your connection is coming across just fine for me. Yep. Yeah, it couldn't be better, you guys. I mean, it's it's mint on my end. It's actually one of the best connections I've had. Um, let's see. All right. I'm literally on top of the router, so if, if it's not coming through, then there's nothing I can do about that. So... Um, yeah, looks like I'm caught up in chat. Uh, let's see, how long have we been going? About 22 minutes. Um, got 15 likes, it looks like. One thumbs down, which is fine. Does not hurt my fing uh, my fingers. Yeah, it doesn't hurt my fingers. Does not hurt my feelings whatsoever. So, all right. Uh, let's see. All right, any questions at all for me? Quality Great White said, yes, I concur. Um, all right, Eric, yes, that one will go on the bags. There's one other paper, too, you can download from the site to get a meeting to fill out fast if no ID yet. Nope, we will get one for you tonight. Awesome, thank you so much, Eric. I will do that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. All right, um, I'm going to be hopping off from here. I'm not going to be carrying on too much longer. Um, just want to show you guys a few updates. Hatch killifish last night, any tips? Um, I would head on over to um, Sherry Lucas. He can give you way more um, tips on the killifish um, than I'm going to at this point in time. So LR Bretts. If you want to drop him a message, maybe. Um, I know that he's been quite busy. But um, my understanding of, like, the... If you're talking, like, the um, the Blue Galaris um, is... Uh, they like murky water. I mean, obviously, good, stable water conditions. Um, you're going to want to pull the fry. Um, I typically pull the fry on everything that I breed. If, if you're doing it not to try to breed on profit or potentially get profit back then go ahead you can always try letting them parent raise I don't think it's going to be successful for you um, so I mean besides like uh, ancestors placos you can definitely that's a whole different story but uh, most other fish I always always pull the fry um, you can use a little bit of methylene blue uh, if you want to, you know, as I just showed a few minutes ago, I did actually add a, a tiny bit of methylene blue on top of the fact that they actually laid right on a catapa leaf, which in my opinion is the most ideal, considering a catapa leaf really has a good, um, a lot of good beneficial components to it, just as far as like antibacterial agents and so forth more naturally. So I think in combination with them actually laying the eggs on the top leaf in conjunction with a tiny bit of methylene blue is the reason I was able to successfully, at this point, um, be able to um, obtain about a 98% um, turnover. Again, things are going to potentially happen, but just based on that, so far everything's looking great. 
So that would be my recommendation, but if you want more concise, obviously you can always check online, look in forums. Um, you can find just about anything online through Google and so forth, but if you want somebody who I know that has personally done it and been successful at it, I would check with Lucas. Do cherry shrimp eat plants or plants they are dying? Yeah, they will. Um, that's why I really, on Holy Orders, would recommend catapa leaves. I've been using catapa leaves for over 10 years since I've been breeding shrimp. Um, and I've been consistently breeding shrimp for that amount of time. And I've always used catapa leaves or the, like the Indian almond leaves. There's other leaves out there. I get mine in from Thailand. Um, I do sell them on the website. I sell them in packs of five. Um, so I know the source I'm getting from because I personally have used them for a long time and I've had no issues as far as, you know, um, any type of, uh, you know, parasites or pesticides or whatever, but I do quarantine them, um, before I end up introducing them into one of my tanks. Um, but yeah, any type of detritus, any dying plant matter, they will scavenge around. That's why a lot of people who breed um, shrimp per se will recommend using um, catapa leaves because it really provides I, I think in my opinion people overfeed on shrimp I don't think that you necessarily have to do that um, I only feed my shrimp once a week because I have so much microorganisms built up because they are seasoned tanks on top of using the catapa leaves um, I would rather underfeed than overfeed because depending on the tank size and so forth I only do top offs on those tanks um, I do not do water changes. I don't foresee myself, unless I notice a swing of nitrates or something like that. So I can't, I guess I'll take that statement back. I can't fairly say I'll never do water changes ever on those tanks because that wouldn't be um, honest. Um, I had to do one 5% uh, water change on one of my setups about a month back due to the fact that there was a little bit too much of nitrate. So I try to remain my nitrates um, anywhere between, for Neocaridina shrimp, anywhere between 5 and 20 ppm. And I find that they successfully will thrive. They'll do fine in that uh, conditions. Now, if I start to notice anything too much under that or over that, then I'll go ahead and make the appropriate adjustments if need be. Um, but yeah, thanks because they're up. Beautiful banana plant when I barely put the shrimp in the beta tank. Gotcha. Yeah. The thing is that people don't realize is with shrimp, shrimp are very cannibalistic. Very, very cannibalistic. I've seen them go after other fish. Um, I've seen them go after one another during molting. Um, so you want to find a good balance. That's why I recommend if you're going to do shrimp, do a species only tank. Don't keep anything else in the tank. Um, try to give them plenty of plant matter, plenty of space. Um, you know, because you're serving one of two things. If you want to be a successful breeder, and I know people have done it, um, is I'm not saying you can't do a community setup, but for me, it's easier for me to monitor if I don't have 10 billion shrimp in one tank. That's why I always have, um, probably at any given time, I might have, let's say, 150 to 200 shrimp, maybe in a 10 gallon tank. And that's just guesstimating, I guess you would say. That's why I have redundancy. I have multiple tanks of the same lines. And if I'm breeding different lines and so forth or different species of shrimp, then I'll have redundancy with those. That way, if anything ever failed, I have something to fall back on. So anybody that has followed this channel long enough, you would have heard a story that happened back last November. And it was due to the fact of a really bad condition that you never want to see in any one of your shrimp tanks because you might as well go ahead and sedate everything because you're not going to have a successful outcome. So I lost over 2,000 Neocaridina shrimp due to the fact that I did not quarantine uh, one of the plants that I picked up from the aquatic experience. I'm not going to mention names. It's not a source that you guys are going to be familiar with. Um, so again doesn't matter the source anybody that ever buys shrimp fish whatever from me quarantine them so I don't care I I tell you guys a quarantine if you don't quarantine and something happens and if you don't follow that recommendation there's not too much I can do to try to help you guys out so you know I expect most people to be honest but you know that's why like when I ship shrimp or fish I'll typically always add a couple of extra it just depends you know i try to bless other people so hopefully they all arrive okay and if they don't 
at least then I can make up for any DOA so I don't have to worry about reshipment of uh, shrimp. So that's why a lot of breeders do that and people who sell uh, online if you want to be successful. So in the end you're saving yourself a lot of time and cost. You might as well go ahead and just add a couple of extra. Is it really going to be um, a huge deal uh, from a cost standpoint down the road by adding two extra shrimp? You're not going to be seeing you know, you're going to have way more losses financially uh, if you don't do that. So always add a couple of extra no matter what you're breeding. Um, now, if you're talking about a rare Placo or something like that, obviously from a cost standpoint, uh, that's apples and oranges. That's not what I'm talking about here, but I'm just talking about shrimp, uh, more of your common species, you know, and so forth. Redneck, hello. Rumug, hello. Uh, Sam said, how should I quarantine the snails? That I'm getting from you or um, do I not need to um, yes yeah, Sam. I mean I have to back up what I said if you have something that you can keep them in snails are a little bit different than than fish um, even if you keep them just in a small Tupperware container with some good bi beneficial bacteria I mean snails can thrive in just about anything um, even the most uh, worst of conditions um, but I would throw a little bit of plants in there maybe a, a catapa leaf um, leave them in there for a few days to a week, um, provide some aeration, uh, maybe a small sponge filter or something. It's always better to be safe than sorry because parasites and so forth and bacteria can travel on anything. So if you think about bacteria, how does beneficial bacteria load build up in the tank? It builds up on your glass walls, it builds up on the slime coat of your fish, it builds up on sponge filters, it builds up on your canister filters, it builds up on your tubes. Bacteria can build up anywhere. That's why I know without any doubts in my mind after I've you know, a $2,000 microscope um, and so forth not that I have but through another source to really identify because I needed to know for certain what I was dealing with back in November of why I had so many die-offs was it something I did was it something um, that wasn't right you know and so forth because of course when you start having die-offs you're gonna frequently start checking um, all of your water conditions and so forth that's just typically a good common practice to do um, and as I started checking the water I'm like wait a minute here this doesn't add up you know there's nothing that I can see with my naked eye you know as far as everything's within check it's within balance um, you know I was uh, checking it uh, on multiple different levels checking and utilizing different tests um, and still wasn't adding up so as I continued then you be able to identify what exactly was going on I actually end up taking a few of the, uh, the sea shrimp to uh, source and was able to utilize a microscope at that point I could identify by matching uh, information uh, via online and then really comparing the overall um, microorganisms and so forth and be able to match everything up and be able to confirm what my suspicion was and uh, my suspicion was due to the fact that I didn't introduce any new shrimp obviously it had to come from the plants so again with the yellow biopsy that I'm specifically speaking of be careful um, because it can travel on the plants. I don't care if anybody wants to argue until they're blue in the face. I know it had to have traveled on that because I didn't add anything else besides the plants to that setup and unfortunately I didn't quarantine them long enough and I lost over 2,000 shrimp and hours of time, hours of money and they were really nice lines because a lot of them um, takes a very very long time, years to eventually get to us. If you're starting out um, on a low grade, so if you're classifying shrimp so I've been specifically breeding the cherry neocaridina shrimp for almost 12 years. And the way I would grade a shrimp is if you understand radio control vehicles, if you guys have ever taken a body of a hobby grade RC car, if you sprayed the outside of that body, it's going to have a way different appearance is if you flip that body over and did it the appropriate way and sprayed on the inside of that body. That's the analogy and the comparison I use when I grade and I look at shrimp, especially cherry shrimp. If I'm looking at a shrimp to identify if it's a true fire red um, or what have you, is it look like it's sprayed on the outside, just speckles of paint, like somebody just did a really shoddy job? Or does it look like they actually did it the right way, flip that body over and actually spray it on the inside so it's really consisting of the majority versus a pigmentation? So hopefully that makes sense um, if you can kind of picture it that way. And that's just kind of the method that I 
have developed in my own mind of how I look at shrimp. So needless to say, it took me years to finally get to that point where I have really good lines. And then unfortunately I had to start all over again um, due to the fact that I lost uh, not only a almost 2,000 Neocaridina shrimp, but also a thousand of my ancestors' plecos, and that's a whole nother story. That was not due to the yellow biopsy. It was a really, really bad case of ick. I trusted the source that I'm not gonna mention that the aquatic experience, and unfortunately, probably with stress and so forth, I didn't quarantine long enough, and that's end up what happening. So it was on one of the smaller uh, ancestress. I was at that time. I was utilizing a central lies filtration system, mm -hmm. and um, there wasn't much I could do. Uh, just yeah, all heck broke loose. And by the time I started treating, I reacted way too late because I overlooked it. So that's why I pay attention to your fish. Don't get lazy. And needless to say, I will never make that mistake again because now I run everything individual. I'll never run on a sump system again when I'm breeding. So, um, yeah, thousands and thousands of dollars in time. Uh, obviously, you can never put money on time. So, just money that I had invested in all of those, you can only imagine. So, for anybody that has had losses, trust me, I can sympathize with you. Um, empathize, whatever. But, yeah. Let's see here gotta go shopping thanks for the stream thank you so much white appreciate it so all i need to do is put some nails in a container for a week and see if anything happens if not then add them yeah just take a preventative measure sam i mean don't add anything to it um you can always use a um this is an old school method so if you want to you can always use a guinea pig is what i call it so if you have like a white cloud or something like that um I wouldn't worry about it, Sam, with the snails. I mean, but if I'm going to practice what I preach, I'm going to have to stick by what I say. It doesn't matter if it's plants, snails, fish, shrimp, quarantine. Because like I said, anything can happen. Wouldn't you rather be safe than sorry? Because everybody says, oh, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that until something happens. Then as soon as something happens, then guess what? They're already now applying what I've been saying for years. It's no different than somebody who doesn't understand chronic pain, as I told you guys. So it's easy for somebody to say, well, have you tried this? Have you tried that? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? Yes, I've been on probably 300 different medications. I've been through multiple surgeries. I have a neuromodulation implanted in me. I deal with chronic pain every day. It's easy for somebody to say, hey, I understand. Well, do you really understand? Because you've been through it. So that's why I have to laugh is in all honesty and, and sincerity though I mean that's why I kind of got sick of being around certain individuals because they didn't understand then I hear a year later they're like now dealing with a minor back issue and they're like oh I can't go anywhere I can't do this I can't do that so on and so forth and it's like oh now you actually understand what I've been talking about tried dealing with it for six plus years due to the negligence of somebody else then come and talk to me so that's no different you know enough of that little rant please do um and i would recommend that to anybody if anybody tells you that no matter what source you get it from don't quarantine then i'll be hightailing it out of there because if you have nothing to hide and if you want to do what's best for the other aquarists and hobbyists that's buying from you you would advise them to quarantine and i don't know too many people that would do that you know especially within the fish fam everybody's going to tell you to quarantine it's better to be safe than sorry um because anything can really happen but yeah so just go ahead quarantine if you have like a white cloud that you can pick up cheap sam i mean if anything was picked up for whatever reason on those snails um obviously you know the source you know me i show you guys all the time i'm competent with it i don't have any issues here but that doesn't mean that something couldn't have happened uh stress and so forth or may have been overlooked is you can always use like a guinea pig fish is what i call it um, you can throw like a white cloud or two in there. They're not going to hurt the, the snails. And um, if anything, like um, ick parasite, if anything was picked up, it would transfer over, in theory, potentially to that, that fish. So you can use that method, but, you know, just use your best judgment. Rum said, I'm still learning too, but it stinks to lose. Yeah, I don't take too much personally anymore. I think if I lost my my ghost knife, 
that would probably hit me pretty hard. I'm not trying to sound like I don't have a heart anymore. Um, but definitely when you've gone through a traumatic experience for me, just compassion in general is very limited for me. Um, and I don't want to say, because most people look at me and be like, Jeremy, you're one of the most compassionate people I know. What do you mean you don't have any compassion? Um, it's just, it's tough dealing with, you know, issues and so forth, but um, definitely coming on here to the fish fam and so forth is what helps me emotionally. Um, I have a lot of people that tell me well, why you're streaming so much. You're only hurting your analytics. And I'm now to the point where I'm really looking at the whole reason why I started YouTube is um, it's that interaction. It's, it's helping me and hopefully I can help you guys um, and so forth. So I don't know yet. I'm still up in the air, you know, on that whole thing. Um, it really does help me. And at the end of the day, you know, if I get through 30 or 40 people that enjoy it, and if I'm touching at least one person, I've done my job at the end of the day. Um, you know, I'm trying to inspire. I'm trying to encourage you guys. Obviously, I'm here on a personal level as well. You can always contact me through email. You know, I've reached out to a couple of people there. Just yeah, I, what I love is to see, especially men opening up about any issues. So rather if it's PTSD that you're dealing with from, um, you know, from the military, whatever it is, um, try to realize that there's hope in some fashion or another. So it only takes one person that you can try to confine in in order to maybe lift your spirits up. So uh, for me, that's where I really enjoy so much about this community. But any last minute questions for me? We've been going uh, about 20 minutes past what I really anticipated doing. Um, so I really appreciate each and every one of you guys in here. So um, that's right, man. Do what makes you happy. Yep. So, you know, I take criticism. And of course, I got my YouTube mentors and so forth that I will look at as mentors. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I have to do what's best for me. Um, you know, I've, I know how to do business. Um, you know, I, I was part of a multi-billion dollar company. Um, you know, I, I started in retail when I was 12, um, started in a salary position when I was 20. And, uh, I've done just about everything from a retail standpoint that you can do. So, you know, there's always a method to my madness. Um, I could definitely boost business I'm confident about that because of my experience but at the end of the day I exactly the key thing I have to do ultimately what makes me happy so I can't be persuaded in one direction or the other from somebody else so if this is my calling right now um, then so be it if I end up losing subscribers because of it because of the whole wonderful YouTube algorithm um, then so be it you know so it is what it is. Um, I enjoy what I'm doing and I don't want to lose and steer away from the whole purpose and point of why I started YouTube. I have never had any desire whatsoever um, to start and it had purely to do with my wife and my kids because they've seen the passion that I have and the drive and the interaction um, that I have be behind the scenes before I start actually putting out uh, video content. But my battery is only on 7%. It's already been warning me. It's beeping at me, even though you guys can't hear it. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to have to end it because in a, I lose connection. Much love to each and every one of you guys. So I'm going to look here at chat and take any uh, last questions and I'm going to have to end this. Um, you're having fun on YouTube going live streamed all the time. I'm right there with you, buddy. Analytics, no or the crappy nothing man uh, this is yep yep no problem so the hard part is for me is I I look at content I have over a hundred videos and I just started in January I would say I really started picking up in March and if we look at apples to oranges to compare video quality and content I know how to produce video because of my background now the thing is do I like editing no that's a weakness of mine not that I can't do it I just don't enjoy doing it um, I enjoy taking video I enjoy doing live streaming um, and so forth. I, I enjoy producing the video. I have lots of videos. It's a matter of taking that time and actually edit it so it makes sense to the general public. Like I said, you guys are in here right now, have been following me. If I want to reach out to a broader base, obviously you have to play the loopholes in the systems of YouTube, but right now I don't know. So right now I do plan on doing um, at least two live streams a week. So real quick, just to reiterate, Tuesdays, Fridays, 1 p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern time on Friday, and at least two videos a week um, as well. So with that being said, you guys, my phone is about to die on me. So as always, stay encouraged. Keep on keeping on. Happy fishing. And we'll talk to you guys next week, Tuesday.